dog tail, a dash of arrowroot. Never before has there been a mixture as magical as this, Harry Potter and Lego. Lego Harry Potter is arguably one of the greatest Lego themes of all time. But it wasn't always like that. There was a point in time in the late 2000s and early 2010s where it felt like we would never see Harry Potter in Lego form ever again. After a tremendous rise and a slow and agonizing fall, Lego Harry Potter has now found its place in the Lego ecosystem. But how did we get here? Well, like most great stories, it has a lot of ups and way more downs, all the way until becoming a legendary tale. This is the death and rebirth of Lego Harry Potter. Nowadays, most Lego fans can't picture a world without licensed themes. But if we go back to the 90s, the idea of licensed products made Lego executives nauseous. As noted by David C. Robertson in his book, Brick by Brick, at the time, Lego executives viewed the idea of licensed products as a dilution of the principles of Lego. When Lucasfilm first approached Lego in 1997 with the idea of Lego Star Wars, they were opposed. But after surveying parents, Lego came back with a completely different picture. Everyone wanted licensed Lego sets. So after 50 years of producing the brick, Lego Star Wars entered development. And after proving to be a massive hit in 1999, Lego looked to Hollywood to find more brands that could slide into the Lego system. Enter Harry Potter. Now, obviously everyone knows the success story behind Harry Potter now, but at the time, while the book series was a phenomenon, the films were unproven. And we've seen time and time again studios kill popular book series with terrible film adaptations. But still, LEGO took the risk and released a wave of 11 sets on September 1st, 2001. And LEGO's approach to Harry Potter was simple. Affordable play sets that let kids build the wizarding world. With a focus on play, you can split the wave into two types of sets the diorama play sets, and the castle system sets. The diorama sets consisted of small $10 builds with cardboard backdrops with one figure and they were mostly small spaces like a Hogwarts castle, the Gryffindor common room, or the Diagon Alley shops. Though this sub theme didn't really take off. The real appeal of the Harry Potter sets were the castle system. This whole idea that you could build the sets ranging from small $10 builds to the $90 castle and put them together to create your own Hogwarts. And the thing is, individually, these were great sets, like the Chamber of Winkies, the Forbidden Corridor, the Final Challenge. They were small but loyal recreations of the movie sequences. But the bigger sets, like the Hogwarts Castle, the Hogwarts Express, and Hagrid's Hut, they were just the cherry on top. Looking back at all these sets together, they really worked well. And while in the year 2000, LEGO suffered a decline in sales, 2001 saw an increase. As noted by LEGO in their 2001 annual report, the sharp rise in sales was due specially to such product series as Harry Potter, Bob the Builder, and LEGO Bionicle. Meaning, on its first year, LEGO Harry Potter had established itself as a key pillar of the brand. For 2002, it was more of the same. One wave of 11 sets, released to coincide with the second film. These also fit in the same castle system. But funny enough, only half of the wave was focused on the Chamber of Secrets, and the other half was based on the Sorcerer's Stone. But what these lack in accuracy, they compensate in fun. And again, most of these sets were affordable. Sets like Troll on the Loose, which retailed for $10, which adjusted for inflation now would be $17. While the build was okay, getting such a big figure at that price is unheard of today. And while now the builds feel outdated, at the time, they did enough of a job to keep expanding the line and adding more elements to the world, like the Chamber of Secrets or Dumbledore's office. The only downside is that these sets didn't sell as well as the 2001 sets. You see, while Lego Harry Potter was the second best-selling theme of the year, it was mostly due from the 2001 wave. As noted by Lego in their 2002 annual report, sales of Lego Harry Potter remained high. In consequence, the first half of the year was substantially better than had been expected when the year began. The problem came in the 2002 holiday season as sales failed to meet expectations. And that leads us to 2003. 
Since there was no Harry Potter film released this year to promote the product, LEGO only released two sets, Quality, Quidditch Supplies, and Nocturnality. But still, the 2002 sets struggled to sell. On their annual report, they noted, A total of 15 LEGO Harry Potter products were launched in 2003, but sales have not lived up to expectations. Though Warner Brothers and LEGO did extend their licensing agreement, to cover the next two Harry Potter films, releasing in 2004 and 2005 respectively. Also, it's important to note that 2003 was a down year for the company as a whole, as competing brands also gained substantial market share. In 2004, LEGO once again released 10 sets to coincide with the release of Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, arguably the best Harry Potter film with a darker tone and story. Though the sets were still mostly affordable playsets like The Escape of Sirius Black, Professor Lupin's Classroom, The Marauder's Map, The Night Bus, and a few remakes of landmark sets like The Hogwarts Express, Hagrid's Hut, and a brand new Hogwarts Castle. And while these sets were a positive in LEGO sales number, the company as a whole kept struggling financially. And well, changes had to be made. One of those was the reduction of SKUs, with LEGO shifting their approach to smaller waves with shorter development timelines, and a focus on always in-demand products. And all of this was evident in 2005, when instead of getting the usual 10 sets, LEGO only made 4 sets to coincide with Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, a decision fans were not happy with, but still remained optimistic for the product. And if I'm being completely honest, this is my favorite year for this era of LEGO Harry Potter. While the castle system set approach was a good concept, these Goblet of Fire sets put that on the side and were a perfect mix of affordable price points, stellar figures, and play. With stark contrast between each set, none of them felt like filler and they all had a strong identity with memorable aspects to them. Sadly, 2006 would mark the first time in 5 years that LEGO didn't release any new Harry Potter sets. While it was evident that Harry Potter was still viewed as a strong asset in the company, they were still financially recovering, so the smart move was to only release product whenever there was a film to promote it. Though with Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix releasing the following year, fans were ecstatic about what sets LEGO could make. Since the Order of the Phoenix is the biggest book in the series, there were so many sequences LEGO could pull from to make great sets, right? For 2007, only one set was made, that being a new version of the Hogwarts Castle, releasing alongside the film and disappointing a lot of fans, mostly because fans were expecting LEGO sets based on scenes like the Department of Mysteries, the Dementor attack on Wisteria Lane, or the Room of Requirements. And they only got this. But looking back on it, this was the right move. At the time, while the Harry Potter brand was financially successful in theaters, each movie became less and less toyetic. LEGO recognized the trend and made the right adjustments. Once again, at the time, what LEGO needed was stability. They simply couldn't risk the sets clogging up shelf space and going on clearance. I believe the only reason they made another Hogwarts castle was because those sets consistently proved to be the best sellers of each wave. So they took the most important characters from the film and packaged it all in one set. After this set retired at the end of 2007, we wouldn't get any new sets in 2008, and when the Half-Blood Prince released in summer of 2009, no product was released to coincide with the movie, which to some signaled the end of LEGO Harry Potter. And reading through old forums, most people just argued about the reasons why the line was killed off. Some pointed out that the movies were getting too dark, others pointed out that the line was always on clearance, but some fans had hoped that with the rumored LEGO Harry Potter game releasing in 2010, that LEGO would revive the line one more time. And they did, because in February 2010, at the New York Toy Fair, a brand new wave of six LEGO Harry Potter sets were officially announced. But these weren't entirely based on the Half-Blood Prince nor the Deathly Hallows Part 1. Since the game covered years 1-4, through four, this wave of sets was more of a greatest hits collection, resulting in some sets being based on multiple films at the same time, like the Hogwarts Express, which included the Flying Fort Anglia, but also Luna Lovegood, and Hagrid's Hut having Aragog and Orbert. But other sets were entirely based on sequences from specific films, 
like Freeing Dobby and the Quidditch match being based on the Chamber of Secrets and the Burrow being based on the Half-Blood Prince. The best set of the wave though, without a doubt, was the Hogwarts Castle. I know now this set isn't as impressive, but at the time, this was the biggest Hogwarts ever made and it featured elements from all films, like Sirius Black in the Gryffindor Common Room, The Vanishing Cabinet, The Astrology Tower, and an absolutely incredible minifigure selection. And with the Harry Potter films ending in summer of 2011, so did the LEGO theme. But thankfully, LEGO released four more sets that year. Diagon Alley, which was a D2C, a new version of the Night Bus, and finally, two sets based on the Deathly Hallows Part 2 in the Forbidden Forest, and a Hogwarts expansion. And just like that, Lego Harry Potter died for good. Well, actually, that's not entirely true. In 2016, around the time the first Fantastic Beasts film released, Lego launched a Harry Potter Dimensions pack, which got many excited, though it was Lego Dimensions, and well, we all know how that ended up. But with Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them making over $800,000 at the box office, it created a wave of Harry Potter nostalgia. And so, LEGO took the risk, and finally, in 2018, LEGO Harry Potter was reborn. And it came back better than ever, with not only a brand new, more complex castle system, but with LEGO being a much larger company, they could give the theme a bigger budget that allowed them to create new elements accurate minifigures, and the building techniques had just evolved so much from the last time we got set that putting the set side by side is honestly unfair. The builds are extremely detailed, and sales-wise, ever since LEGO Harry Potter came back, it's been consistently one of the best-selling LEGO themes year in and year out. But how is LEGO doing this? Because while Harry Potter merchandise has been extremely popular in recent years, Harry Potter toys, like action figures, dolls, and playsets, historically haven't. Since 2001, multiple toy companies have tried, and even in recent years, McFarlane, Spin Master, and Mattel have produced Harry Potter toy lines, and yet, they all ended up failing. The only company that has consistently found success with Harry Potter toys is LEGO. And I think it's because most brands have treated Harry Potter like if it's Star Wars or Marvel focusing on selling the characters. But the current Harry Potter design team understands something that others don't, and it's that people like the world more than the characters. Like as an example, as a kid, I used to dream about receiving my Hogwarts letter in the mail. I used to dress up as Harry for Halloween. I would always ask my parents to take me to the Universal theme park. But I never asked my parents for a grip hook or Flitwick action figure. Most Harry Potter fans I know have wands or time twisters in the room, but nobody has the NECA figures. And that's what makes LEGO Harry Potter special. People want the world or specific scenes. The characters are simply accessories. While other LEGO themes are heavily criticized for their exclusive minifigures or lack thereof, LEGO Harry Potter just focuses on making great sets people actually want. But hey, that's just my brick opinion. I always knew I wanted to make a video covering the first era of LEGO Harry Potter, but while making this video, I really rediscovered my love for the brand. Because looking back on it, in recent years, I have grown a certain disdain for the Harry Potter brand as a whole. Just because how disappointed I was in the Fantastic Beasts films it really blinded my love for the brand, which sucks because I grew up as a pretty big Potterhead. You know, I have the books, the games, the wands, the toys. Heck, the only reason I am a LEGO fan is because of Harry Potter. Because before 2010, I didn't really like LEGO system sets. I was more into like the buildable figures like Bionicle or Ben 10. But I remember walking down the toy aisle and being in awe at the 2010 wave of Harry Potter sets. I remember buying the Freeing Dobby set on a family trip, building it in the floor of my hotel room, and falling in love with Lego as a 7 year old. While I haven't bought any new Harry Potter sets in the past few years, I always look at them and crave them. But because my room is so small, I fear out-Legoing myself. 
But with the new wave that just released, I think it's time to jump back into the wizarding world and reconnect with that thing that I loved as a child. Anyways, thanks for watching and take care.